All right, so I'm gonna hit record and uh, we can we can go forward here. Looks like everybody uh, late morning, early afternoon for you, Elizabeth. Um, Matt, was there any discussion about the info that Michelle Barker shared? Not really. Last we went right okay. into the software updates and just okay. trying to kind of sort that out. All right, so I'll um I'll just call people's attention back to this that. Uh, Michelle is looking to curate uh, resources for policies that research organizations have for generating research software. Um, and then there's some artifacts here that we can join in to if we want to. And that's uh, all the details are under the previous meeting. Um, for software updates, you may or may not have noticed that- uh, I, have, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. You can yep. see it up since you were part of it. I was not. Um, well, so I just, I wonder, you know, how maybe in this group we can think about our relationship with some of the things that, say, Michelle is doing or Dan is doing. So, like, in the university open source working group, we have a couple different organizations that are thinking about open source in the universities. Right. You know? And so I've been chatting with, um, say, like, Richard at Sustain and... Um, Claire with the, the curious network, um, you know, and we're trying to figure out how we can support each other without necessarily replicating the work of the others. So I'm wondering if we sh should do this here, because there does seem to be a whole lot of activity and engagement around scientific open source software. Mm, so say things like what CZI is potentially funding or what Michelle is doing, or I, it just, it feels like there's a lot of pieces and we don't have a way to kind of hold them all up to the light and think about how we can support each other. Yeah. I mean, I have a... I mean, I have a sense of how we've been doing it with Michelle, which has been just kind of collaborating in the, our, our various initiatives across communities. But that's been like Michelle and I, for the most part, crossing those lines. And Dan, of course, Dan's very active with uh, work Michelle's doing. And of course, Fair for RS. Yeah. So some of this is that a lot of the conversation isn't centered in the chaos community. It's uh, adjacent to the chaos community. So what is, ways. so there's a, a lot of conversation of what, that has happens outside of us. Yep. Uh, do you have a sense of like what the primary objectives of those conversations are if you're in them? You know, like, like when what, I, what Michelle is trying to, like what's the long-term goal for RISA, things like FAIR for, for RS, for research software? I think in the case of both of them, an underlying long-term goal is the professionalization of research software engineering, that there's a, a recognition within both of those collectives of groups that um, professional research software, software engineers are going to be necessary to sustain the scientific OSS enterprise. Okay. That, uh, that you know, having scientists write uh, postdocs or grad students into three to five year proposals every three to five years isn't a way to, you know, sustain software that becomes highly useful and productive. Okay. And so that's my sense. I welcome other people's perspectives from conversations they had. So then what, how does, for, from your perspective, how does chaos plug into that conversation? I think how we have plugged in and, and the place where we've been useful are really on two fronts. One, our DEI program, which is a lot of the collaboration I had with uh, a workshop that Michelle and I organized in Amsterdam in 2023. Mm -hmm. And then I, I think just us listening to the scientific software enterprises, Michelle conceptualizes it and as Dan conceptualizes it, and when we talk to people in those spaces, there is a need to understand some notion of health and sustainability. And I think, you know, for example, when we talked to the university group yesterday and when I uh, had a conversation, Kelly and I had a conversation with Greg offline 
about mm -hmm. some of the software stuff, I think there's a a need to have some very basic metrics presented. And they're not, I think, in a lot of cases for the scientific enterprise, like in a Nessus world where you have some of these very giant, large projects with lots of contributors, some of those projects, the bigger ones under NUM Focus, don't have the same profiles and questions as a lot of the smaller scientific projects have. And so what what researchers need from something like chaos is I think it's different than use cases that we've explored in other domains, even, even different than the university domain, because I think when we're talking to scientists and research, talking about research software, there's a lot more small repos that are critically active. Um, repos that with that level of activity and those numbers of contributors would not be sustained in a corporatized setting or in other settings, but are sustained in science. Okay. So I have this, I have this sense that like corporatized open source is pretty far along. You know what I mean? Like they've been having this conversation around understanding the health of the projects that they care about. And it's the shared for infrastructure that they get, right? It's that, that, that they spread the maintenance in corporatized. I don't think, open source scientific software is thinking that way. Yeah, so I feel like that those conversations in the corporate space are pretty mature just because they've been going on for so long. And I think a lot has been sorted out. In our meeting yesterday with university, I feel like those are considerably more nascent and trying to figure out where um, metrics can play an important role or how where measurement can play an important role. Um, in helping the university open source endeavor. So how do you, you know, where do you see science as, let's see, you're putting something in the chat, but where do you see the scientific software kind of falling in that regard? So I think one of the organizational advantages that the university group has is they're thinking about it institutionally. That's yep. kind of the charge of the university OSPO. I think the scientists who are writing this, the smaller scale, smaller contributor group software, which is a lot of open source scientific software. In those cases, those, those folks are scientists and they have different questions and it's many of the questions they have will be similar. So I think there's an opportunity for us to provide metrics or little dashboards that give scientists a sense of their projects or perhaps suggest projects of a similar scale in a similar domain based on the large collection that we have so they can do comparisons. So do you think there's yesterday, for those of you that weren't on the university call, we were kind of thinking about metrics in the way of like how you might understand engagement in open source, but we hadn't ended up having to back up a little bit to think about how researchers at a university, like why would they even participate in open source in the first place? So a lot of our, our conversation moved kind of away from how, which is a secondary question to more mm -hmm. why you would even do this in the first place. Um, and so when I talk about corporate open source, I think that why question has been answered a long time ago. Like why would a company participate in open source? And a lot of the focus is on how to get that work done. I think in the university, we were we were focusing a little bit on how you would participate in open source. A lot of folks were like, listen, we just need to have a first first conversation as, as to why this would be even beneficial to researchers at the university in the first place, let alone kind of those downstream how questions. Do you all have a sense in the scientific software community that we're past those why questions? Like why? Uh, yeah, I see a hand up. So yeah, Bill. Yeah, um, I can give you some perspective, I think, on this. So I've been, um, you know, it's one of the founders of Kitware. We're a commercial company, but we do scientific computing software. And we've been, you know, one of our very first contracts was with the NIH to create um, an open source toolkit for doing mm -hmm. segmentation and registration of uh, medical image data. Mm -hmm. um, but we've been working a lot with the DOE, which is which is what landed us here in this, me in this call, um, because the DOE just finished the exascale computing project. And then they had all this 
great software they created and a lot of it was open source, but then how do they sustain it after that that big funding effort left? And and that I think is the uh the the question, right? Of how you create they want this software to sustain and to move forward, right? Because if you want to move science forward, you have to sort of the language of science has become software, right? Mm -hmm. So for any implementation of anything, there has to be an implementation out there for someone to build on and make the next version of it and to improve on it um, instead of having everybody rewrite stuff over and over and over again. But the uh, I, I think right now what the DOE is looking for is ways to measure that. So they've got all this software and it's all kinds of different levels of quality. And basically it, a lot of that has to do with who is on the team that that created it right was it was it a bunch of physicists with no one any that did any software engineering well it's probably going to have a lot of issues they might have made it open source um but it's gonna have so how do they go and measure all that software and find out where the resources are needed and and which software you know needs what um so i think we are we're looking for tools and ways of measuring things and hopefully somewhat automated tools and, and not so that funding could get redirected like, well, this is, and you want to measure a lot of angles too, right? A lot of axes because you want to like, is this like a really key piece of software that a whole bunch of people are using, but it also has like really poor quality. Well, then we should invest in the, mm -hmm. the quality and the infrastructure of that software. Are there like, you know, three people in the world using this software? And it's like the best quality software in the world. Well, it probably doesn't need resources, right? So then it gets down to resource management. So it's really important that this stuff um, is fair and impartial, but but just gives a lens and a gauge on on what's going on out there. And I, I don't think it's as much. Um, most folks are sold on the idea of open source. Okay. But a lot of people have a different idea of what that means. And and like you said, the so we're a commercial company that supports open source software, but we've been doing this dance for 25 years now. Um, and it, it's a hard one because people want to pay for research of new and exciting things. There isn't a great business, you know, if it's open source, there isn't like, like I developed this CMake build system. I don't get a dime when everybody uses it, but there's 9 million users out there. And there's not a great, there aren't a great level of uh, you know um, ways of commercializing that. You know we sell services around it. We can add features to it, but we're constantly looking for that next round of funding or trying to fit lots of different blocks together to get to get it funded. Um, so that's the the dance that you kind of have to play with a lot of this scientific software. It may become wildly popular and very useful, but there may not be a great way for anybody to monetize it. Um, so being able to measure that and figure out where its deficiencies are can help the people that are depending on it. Well, that's, that helps that a lot. Or... <laughs> no, that helps a lot. Thank you. <laughs> you. You answered everything you say makes a lot of sense. And it just provides clarity to me. And it's just kind of like where the focus of measurement is sometimes. And I think you. I, I wrote think... um, summary. Yeah. My summary of what you were saying, Bill, is I wrote, it's kind of this question of knowing how it's going in a lighter weight manner than the metrics that in chaos, we're often talking about community health because that's where these the scale of projects we've often been involved with exist. I think in the case of science, there are more basic software questions about sustainability, maintainability, documentation that need to be answered. And a lot of scientists don't have an aspiration of even developing a community around their project. Would that be, does that capture what you were saying or is it completely amiss? Yeah, that's that's, that's pretty close. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, some of them may not might not care about the community, right? They would, they just want their next grant funding and to, to really focus on the science. Um, but the problem is, you know, to be able to focus on the science, you need good software these days. Yeah. You need to build a foundation. And the, the old model of just having grad students, you know, write up this algorithm that that takes a, you know, a month or two to, to put together isn't sustainable. 
right? We need longer lasting software. We need that software to be able to something you can build upon and, and build new versions on and, and build this foundation instead of sort of the, the university model where, you know, and there's a lot of churn. So you really need to put a lot of process around that software, right? So that, so that the grad student can come in and contribute to it in a way that makes it something that's going to be sustainable and not something that's got to get thrown out six months later after he leaves because no one knows how it worked and you know it only it only worked for one one paper so those are a lot of the questions right is it yeah is it sustainable is it is it something that that's going to be around for a few years right because if it's not, no one's going to pick it up and adopt it. They're going to go off and write their own thing that'll disappear in six months or a year. And I do think this aligns with what Greg was talking about a couple of weeks ago and kind of the concerns or the questions he had around Augur software, like being able to provide insight on a collection of projects. I'm not sure if that collection is like a supply chain collect, you know, like a dependency collection or an ecosystem collection, but I think um, it's, you know, if it, I'm, I think, Greg, you're talking about projects that a particular group of scientists care about, right? Um, well, a group of people that are developing similar software, I mm -hmm. guess. I don't know if I'd say scientists necessarily. Um, I, I would add to what Bill was saying. I mean, I think that the problem is that these days you simply cannot do you know what you used to be able to do uh and have a bunch of grad students build you know some piece of software because the underlying architectures and systems are so complicated uh you know it took it took thousands of people seven years to build the ecp software stack and uh you know that that's just not a feasible thing to do anymore um so so somehow that software has to get maintained um and and sustained um in some way and and i agree with with bill you know it's not really commercializable software like it's hard to imagine how you can get you can you can get um commercial funding for for a lot of that software um because there's things like CMake and other, you know, uh, the MPI implementations and math libraries, and I mean, some of it maybe, uh, but a lot of it is very specific to HPC and and you know, not necessarily widely uh, applicable across an industry. But so, you want, you know, the, the, the funding channel, you know, the DOE or whatever, you know, if there is some math library or something that's very important to the science, if we can show that importance and then show where, it, what funding it needs to be able to sustain, right? But, but people just say, you know, we need sustainable software. What, what does that mean? You know, so I think defining that and coming up with a more rigorous definition of what sustainable is in the context of scientific software um, would is really the kind of that's what we're searching for here um, some way to to quantify that and measure it so that it it can be addressed or not addressed right it, but at least you can point to it and say you know if this this gets used by you know the whole community and it needs these things if you want it to be here in 10 years or it's just going to you know, you're, you're building on a crumbly foundation. Yeah, that's this is super helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm putting dependencies up on the list I had above. And I think what I'd, I'd say that what you're describing is if we can understand the importance of software in your overall scientific supply chain, and that likely includes projects that your project depends on. And if you've got 100 projects, knowing the dependencies that are most prominent across that whole collection, probably helps you know where you potentially have vulnerabilities of the depend things you depend on going away. Yeah, I think dependencies are a, an important part of it, definitely. You know, software that has a lot of dependencies on it, um, you know, is is clearly 
important to the community and needs to be sustained in some way, you know, so that can help focus where you maybe want to put resources. Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely a big factor. But yeah, I like that because most, most of the time when you talk about dependencies, you talk about things you depend on, but I haven't seen much, a, a great measurement <laughs> That would be awesome is how many things depend on this right because you may not depend on that many things at all so it looks like oh this, this is sort of a standalone thing but there's ten thousand really important projects that depend on you and if you look at something like curl is probably a good example of that you know everything uses curl does curl get a lot of attention or funding probably not <laughs> um and we saw that with open ssl Right, it's the same problem there, right? It was this this little library, and then that you know the the security flaw came out, and everybody lost their lost their lunch over there. Oh my God, how could this possibly happen? The whole world was depending on this this thing, and it you know who who was supposed to be taking care of that? You know that that sort of thing. So being able to point out that hey, this is a really important piece of software because like everything in the world depends on it. Who's and and who's yeah. and is sustainably being you know maintained, or is it like one guy that somehow you know just wrote this thing and everybody started using it because it was really useful, and it's hugely vulnerable to the supply chain. So but recognizing that, that would be really that applies cool. to uh, you know sort of libraries and and tools and infrastructure and things like that. But but I think when you get to the application level, then dependencies things that depend on you are not so important you know like an application's measure of of health is probably more about their community if we're talking about you know a large a large uh community developed code or something like that so i think there's you know different uh there's going to be different measures uh depending on the type of software and you know where in the software stack you're actually looking which is why i was saying the other day sean you know that uh because the the groupings that we have you know relate to that to some degree so some of them are uh you know some of the groupings are say for example um system software or or you know libraries uh others might be programming tools and and uh, performance tools and things like that. Um, and I think that they're going to have different, and then applications may be another area too, right? But we don't actually have them at the moment, but we may, we may get them. But I think they're going to all have different kinds of metrics they're interested in. There's probably like a base set of metrics, um, which that, that applies to them all things like you know how good your documentation is and, and what your software engineering practices are and so forth but then i think there are going to be different ones like how many dependencies you have uh, there are on your particular piece of software for example um, that are more important to some of these groupings than others than other groupings mm -hmm. so that's why we kind of need the ability to i think customize at least our our visualizations, um, you know, our our measures in some way uh, to to be able to tailor them to these different. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think in the case of the scientific software enterprise, there's a different standard set of metrics than exist in the corporatized space, just yep. because the scale, at least for the projects that are below some scale defined by a number of contributors. Yeah, and this is all super helpful because I, well, as Greg knows, I've I've agreed to do a, a talk at a mini symposium about using metrics to improve project sustainability. So um, my my plan is is to spend some time thinking about this along with these notes over the next next couple of weeks. So what I'd like to do is maybe bring an initial version of that presentation into into this group and get your feedback on it before we before we take it to that symposium. So I hopefully that, in the next. I think that sounds yeah, great. Uh, yeah, maybe in the next month or so. I've got some some travel, but the next one I attend, maybe I will have something but better to share.
We're also planning to submit a workshop proposal to supercomputing. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that. That's a pretty big, well, it's like the, the premier uh, high performance computing uh, conference. It's in, typically it's in November, um, the week before Thanksgiving. Yeah, the week before Thanksgiving. That's just cruel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But it usually gets about ten thousand people at least go to that. Um, with a you know, it has a huge. Um, I, I think Bill, you have a booth, don't you? <laughs> they have a big trade show. Um, but uh, we're going to propose a workshop, a half day workshop on on this topic as well. So, um, you know, uh, you guys definitely be uh, be encouraged, welcome to come and participate in that. Well. No, I'd uh, be happy to participate in conceptualizing that with you, Greg. Yeah, I think that would be great because it's it's also based in Atlanta. So I've I've taken a couple of the ones that Greg has proposed for for Europe. I think Sean, it'd be great if you could. Yeah. Do that. Go one. to Atlanta. <laughs> so, um, uh, just uh, following up on that, um, Greg, uh, I wasn't at the last meeting, but. I did look at your comments in the um, in the chat and talked to Matt or looked at the notes and um, then we talked a little bit about Augur and eight knot and I I think making eight knot produce the kinds of metrics that you're that would be different for science is a relatively light lift because the framework's in place so I know Callie is going to be working through that with discussions um, and I also wanted to point out that the one bug that you identified which was super annoying in auger <clears throat> is fixed where the there were a bunch of visualizations that didn't come up what was the one that you were do you remember the one you specifically pointed out it's coarser um coarser colon um was it uh hang on oasis Yeah, Oasis sounds familiar. No, try Corsa. Corsa is the name of the the user that I set up. Colon. Can you do colon? Yeah. Um, I need a bit project name. I should go look at the. Sorry. Yeah, just take a second and find it. Okay. I can find it. So... Trillinos. You got it. Yep. Put that link here. Well, now it's slow, so I'll come back. It is slow. Yeah, I don't know why it's, uh... oh, there it goes. All right, so a lot of these that, all of, there were a bunch of these that were not enough data, and I fixed all but one of them. Okay. It was basically, it was basically just a null, null data problem. So, like, in the case of, like, if there aren't, nobody comments on any pull requests, it's just empty. Um So yeah, I fixed fixed that bug. So what are we seeing here? And Greg, how is these? This? This is just the Augur dashboard. And one of the things Greg pointed out was that these were all missing data, or they showed not enough data, which didn't make sense. And he was right. So Greg, I'm curious, like based on the conversation we had a couple of weeks ago, like has this moved things forward? And are there still questions that remain for you? You know, I don't know if you've had a chance to tons of. 
we've talked to Greg. I mean, I think okay. he still has tons of questions. <laughs> okay. Greg can speak for himself, though. If you try Cocos kernels, too, there's still a bunch of not enough data in that. Uh, Which one? Cocos kernels. K-O-K-K-O-S hyphen kernels. This one here. Yep. Let me look at that one. It um, usually when I see this, we don't need to spend a lot of time on here, but I'll follow up. It's okay to spend yeah. time here, I think. Yeah. It's okay. So there are pull re there are pull requests on this one, so. I have to go figure out why they are not showing up, up in uh it looks like uh response times comments so i'll go look at uh kkos kernels and figure out what's going on there hmm. uh, so, yeah, go so, sorry matt no 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 go ahead greg well i was just going to respond <laughs> to to your question before so um we uh well i met i met with um uh Callie, was it from yeah. red yeah. hat uh we we talked about some of uh, the sort of requirements that we think we're going to have in terms of visualization um i so that's really where i I've, I've got at the moment which is essentially setting up auger to you know to ingest a bunch of uh, data from from repos that we're interested in uh we we discovered in the process of doing that that uh gitlab and bitbucket aren't or weren't supported at the time um i think that you've added gitlab support yep. now yeah so okay. I've yet. I don't think I've gone back and added all the GitLab. There was a there was a two or three GitLab repos that people were using, um, and then I think there's one or two Bitbucket repos. I think the problem with Bitbucket is that it it just has the, you know, it really just has the code in it. They use Jira or something else, I think, for for doing their issue tracking. I don't think that's part of Bitbucket, so I'm not sure that you're going to be able to get as much data out of that anyway. Um, so that's, but that's not a big, that's not a big issue. It's just something that I came up against when I was, uh, I was setting things up. Um, and then, yeah, so I did that, um, and, and I played around a little bit with, you know, obviously the auger, uh, the display, you know, the, the visualizations, and then also took a look at eight knot, but I couldn't really get much out of eight knot, um. It was, you know, I was sitting there for, I, I left it running for, a, I think about an hour or something and didn't get any data, you know, it was still, it was still processing stuff. So, um, yeah, there was some performance issues there. Um, yeah, I don't know when you did that, but after, right around the time of that call last week, I did, or two weeks ago, I did up the configuration after after the FOSDEM, I got some performance tuning advice from them. So I don't know if there's better performance on eight knot now. But uh, yeah, I just had a chance to go back and and take another look at it. So that's that's where I've got to so far. Um, and then obviously had that discussion with Sean and Kelly about the uh, about the UI. And um, yeah, so that's where we're at. Um, I really haven't sat down and sort of looked at the visualizations that you that you're providing in Augur, I just like li literally just wanted to get the pictures there initially. Yeah, I haven't like drilled into what they actually mean and and you know what they're telling us at this point. So that's something I've got to do as well. Okay, that's helpful. And I recall there was an issue or a question that you had around creating groups. Was that right? That there were. There was kind of a desire you had them named there was like a well i have i have set up groups in august okay. which correspond to our 
what we call software sustainability organizations. So they're just yes. they're groupings of like-minded projects, essentially. Okay. And so I've already set that up. Um, I think we, we're going to need some kind of visualization capability that lets us sort of summarize what's going on in a group, um, or at least at some level. You know, so because at the moment, really, you can only uh, get like a single project detailed information. Um, and we want something, I think, more high level than that, like it's more of a summary of, of mm -hmm. the project to give an indication of sustainability, you know, so yeah. something someone could look at and say, okay, well, yeah, this project is, you know, sustainable on some spectrum you know, whatever that is, low sustainability, high, however you want to measure that. Um, so, and then have that for each project on a dashboard. Um, so we need sort of something at that level. Um, so that's kind of what we were talking about earlier okay. this week, um, how we do that. I'm curious, yeah. Don, have you, when you were taking a look at things at VMware, did you ever look at things at a, like an aggregate or an index level of groups? Or of projects, I should say. Uh no, no, I didn't. Um, okay. Partly because, um, yeah, it's just kind of hard to aggregate projects because they're they were all very different. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't something that we really did. Okay. And Greg, you feel that like creating how many are in an SSO? Like, what would be a like ten? uh it varies i okay. think um, how many are in the oasis one is the largest one um, where is that um, i guess my just my first reaction would be would you be concerned that creating an index would potentially hide a problem of a particular project like the index could say <laughs> Everything looks solid based on, you know, 14 of the 15 projects performing well. No, I wasn't thinking of aggregating it up to the up to the group level. Um, so I don't think the group, I don't think we need to say a group, um, you know, has a particular okay. sustainability, just the projects within the group. Okay. be able to visualize them, you know, say on a single page or something like that. I see. So you wouldn't make a, a, an assumption on that group, but no. Would, okay. Okay. No. And, and you, yeah. you expressed a desire to drill in and drill out of groups as well. Okay. No, that's great. That makes sense. And so Sean is, does Augur 8 not provide that ability to create? So these I mean, groups. it's high, eight knots highly customizable with little effort. I mean, basically, Augur handles all the data engineering, so eight knot can focus on the data science. Yep. And um, so I think everything that Greg's describing could be a scientific view. Um, Callie's interested in it because I think open science is part of what IBM, Red Hat's owner, is interested in. So I, I think there's a, an alliance of interests uh, around helping helping sort this out for the research software community okay try to provide something more useful and obviously the work don's doing is going a long way towards helping us get there as well okay this is really helpful and a good follow-up i think from two weeks ago that's amazing since i wasn't here well it's nice i think a lot of it is async you know, yeah, yeah, offline a little bit, so that's cool. Um, so after after that, just um, I mean, I pulled this down from before, and I think I just I just brought down like quality, maintainability, documentation, release cycles, dependencies. These seem like core concerns that are maybe uh, focused more more on the software sustainability directly than some of the standard chaos metric models that focus on various components of community health. So um, I think this is input to take into that design process. So Sean, do you think it's kind of like what we had in the university group discussion yesterday? Like what would be the good proxy measures for quality? Like release cycle seems like it might be its own thing. 
Yeah, I think like I think the questions that Greg is asking and that the university folks ask do look across these collections of projects or these groups. I think then the separate view of that is that if I'm a scientist who's only concerned with the Oasis group, I, I want to I'm just going to be looking at that group and maybe looking at or having the desire to see other projects that are maybe similar in scope and scale and how they function different. My question was kind of like, like you have quality there as something to take a look at. So yeah. like, what would be the representative measures in this situation that would provide insight on quality? Um, I think, uh, you know, the proxies I can think of that would be uh, code, you know, various uh, code smells like how it's designed, how maintainable it is, probably run some code scanners against it. Um, quality has always been a hard one for us to tease out. Um, I think release cycles are possibly a proxy for quality on smaller scale projects. Um, I think documentation is a signal that you want other people to use it. I'm thinking it might be worth so I, having a proxy for quality, I think is a worthy discussion item for yeah. another day. And maybe, well, or maybe we could have it on Slack. Like how would we operationalize this setup? So, uh, one thing I was going to say is we have this, uh, we have a national labs information technology summit coming up in April and it's, um, uh, there's a software sustainability conference as part of that, which we have uh, we have a, work, a sort of a mini workshop. It's only it's only an hour and a half, I think, so it's pretty small. But it would be good actually if we could take some of these questions to that workshop, right? Because the idea would be to get a bunch of people together and talk about um, you know what metrics are important to people. Well, what I mean, these are sort of high level concepts, aren't they? Rather than metrics, yeah, in the real interview, like, how would we measure, you know, documentation or how would we measure dependencies or something like that? So, if you could come up with some suggestions, like if you over the you know coming weeks, if you could think about like actual metrics that you know are being collected that might feed into these, then uh, we could take that along to this meeting and you know, use that as a starting point and say to people, well, here, you know, here's some suggestions. What do you think of this? Uh, do these make sense? Are there any other things that might be missing? That kind of thing. Um, so I think that could be really good. I'll take so, an action item to bring that, yeah. bring some suggestions back to the next meeting. Others are welcome to also contribute. Could we start this in the Slack channel? Maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just in OSS science. And then we could, when is the meeting, Greg? It's in April. Um, okay, April. so it's a little ways away. April 8th. Okay. And what would be nice too, Sean, is like thinking about how to operationalize these. Um, like if we start in the Slack channel, like you can bring up ways that you know Augur as an yeah. example. Can, 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 yeah. can what can provide. Sometimes when we start the other way around, people have all sorts of suggestions and we're like, yeah, we can't. We can't do that, <laughs> you know, for the complexity is just too hard. Yeah. So it would be nice to start maybe from software, like what you know the capabilities are. So, yeah. I'm cool. noting that. Yeah, that's cool. All right. And I think that could be, you know, like our first really good opportunity to get some input directly from the community into these metrics and then we've got the past conference that dawn's going to be at that's another opportunity you know to, to talk more about this and get more feedback and then maybe then we can start like implementing some of these in, in auger you know collecting the data displaying it and then at this at the supercomputing conference in november uh, you know then we can really have something we can we can talk about and get people to participate in and and you know continue to to evolve that maybe make it more complicated more sophisticated this is great yeah that's really great thanks greg thanks assuming we thanks, get Bill. 
Thanks, uh, everyone. Assuming the, uh, yes, the workshop is is accepted. <laughs> Let's, we'll go under that assumption. Yeah, we're going to work. I have a lot assumption. of faith in y'all. <laughs> well, it's pretty competitive. So I don't know. Yeah. And we are about at time now. So um, I've got some action items and um, look forward to talking with y'all again in two weeks. Thank you. It was a really nice conversation, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, really nice. Thank you very much. Okay, Thank thanks. you. Take care. Bye-bye.